Welcome everyone. I know uh, we still have uh, some folks joining as we get started here, but uh, I really appreciate everyone taking time out of their extremely busy schedules uh, to join us for Bob Woodruff Foundation's Straight Talk, Understanding Nonprofit Status. Um, I have the pleasure of knowing a lot of you on the call, but my name is Deirdre Armstrong and I'm the Director of Partner Engagement here at the Foundation. Um, and I'm really excited about our webinar today. We're gonna to be discussing um, and exploring tax exempt designations and tax filing choices uh, with several founding nonprofit leaders, um, as well as those that are recently registered nonprofits. Um, those partners who are joining our panel today will share their experiences firsthand uh, from creatively tapping into community resources to developing mission-driven 501c3s with broad impact. And each speaker will illustrate their own unique path towards nonprofit status. Um, and I'd like to encourage folks, uh, you know, as you have questions that come up uh, throughout the webinar, to utilize the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen um, to share those questions you might have, and, and we hope to, to get to them uh, towards the end of the webinar. But before we dive into our material, I'd like to introduce my colleague uh, leading today's webinar, Macy Calvert. Macy? Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. I really appreciate everyone's attendance, and we are really excited to deliver this content for you all. Um, I will start it off with a really exciting video from our co-founder, Dave Woodruff. Hi, this is Dave Woodruff, co-founder and chief development officer for the Bob Woodruff Foundation. I'm sorry I can't join you live today, but I wanted the chance to be able to tell you the origin story of the foundation and how we made the decision to form our foundation with a 501c3. Back in 2006, when my brother was reporting for ABC News from Taji, Iraq, he was blown up by an IED. And he ended up at Bethesda Naval Hospital after being treated by the heroes in Baghdad and in Lanshtul. And we arrived there and were thrown into a military community we had never had any experience with. And we very quickly realized while Bob lay in a coma and the months after he woke up and was recovering, that the soldiers, sailor, sailors, airmen, and Marines that we met did not have the resources that we had. And it very impacted us very much. And we made a promise that if we were able to, we could do something about that. We weren't sure what that was going to be. But after a time, as Bob recovered and it became very clear that he was going to be able to go back to work at ABC News, that we could use his celebrity, use his voice to raise some money to help some of the families at Bethesda Naval. And we thought we could do that by forming some kind of an organization. At the time, we weren't sure what that could be. But after talking to some friends from the Brain Injury Association of America who came to our side because Bob's injury, his signature injury, was traumatic brain injury, they offered to allow us to ride along on their 501c3 and form a foundation and work as our fiscal sponsor, which worked really, really well for us. And it worked great as we started off forming the foundation and raising money as, as best we could. And then all of a sudden, when the generosity of Bruce Springsteen and the New York Comedy Festival's folks, Andrew Fox and Caroline Hirsch came along and said they would run an event for us called Stand Up for Heroes, it very quickly became something that was a bit too much for BIA to handle because we had so much coverage and so much attention and really so much money being brought to the foundation, which was an incredible blessing. So we decided it would be the right thing to do to professionalize the organization and by getting our own 501c3 giving Susan Connors and her team at BIA her foundation back. So we decided to do that, and it was a great decision because the 501c3 structure had worked very well for us already. And we also realized that, you know, Bob's persona, his, his journalistic persona and his public persona really dictated that we needed to use a 501c3 structure to create a public foundation and not a private or a family foundation. So we decided to, to get our own 501c3. The process was not easy, but it was worth it because now after 16 years of the foundation going and doing the kind of work it has done, it's been working very, very well because it also put rigor into our processes. It put a lot of discipline into what we do. And that has been a great, great aid to 
placing us in the position that we are as one of the top U.S. charities and certainly one of the top veteran serving organizations. So if you're thinking about forming a foundation or you already have and you're looking at designations, I would encourage you to consider 501c3, especially if you want it to live beyond reproach because the, the reporting structure requires it. But most importantly, no matter what you decide to do, if you decide to help service members, their families, and veterans, and we applaud you and we appreciate you and we thank you for what you're doing. Thank you today for giving us that video as although he couldn't be with us today on the webinar. And we will move into the slides portion of our webinar now, and I'll explain the agenda for today. So welcome to Straight Talk Understanding Nonprofit Status. We really appreciate you guys taking your time out of your day today. So today we're going to understand the different tax exempt statuses, as well as explore different tax filings and look at considerations for both. We'll also look at the characteristics of a good fiscal agent. And during these portions of the slides, I'm going to be quite brief. We're going to do a very foundational knowledge. Um, and then we're going to move into our panel discussion with our four amazing panelists. They're going to carry a lot of the content with their lived experience and details. And then you can use the Q&A feature throughout because at the end, we'll, we'll save time for the Q&A with the panel as well. So here at Bob Woodruff Foundation, we have our Got Your Six network, which is comprised of partners across the nation serving military and veteran communities. And in our network, we have 501c3s and 501c19s. We also have over 70 partners who are using a fiscal agent, meaning that they do not have a tax exempt status of their own. And for the organizations that have received BWF funding, they are filing 990s and 990EZs per our due diligence standards. Tax exempt statuses. So there are over 20 501c somethings designations in the IRS tax code. This includes clubs, cemeteries, insurance companies, credit unions, trusts, and a specific one just for veterans. So our 501c3s are those typical charitable organizations that can be religious, educational. It covers a lot of what we're all familiar with. Some examples include us, Bob Wedge Foundation, as well as Blue Star Families. A 501c4 is more focused on those social welfare causes. Some examples include American Civil Liberties Union, Miss America Organization, and even homeowners associations. And then we have our 501c19s, and those are the ones just for veterans. That is veteran membership organizations and some examples that you may be familiar with in the space are the American Legion and Military Officers Association of America. In the 501c3 and 501c4 space, we have some overlap, but some really key differences. They both educate about public policy or can, and they both can fund nonpartisan voter registration and get out to vote drives even provide political education and sponsor debates for political candidates. The key difference is 501c3s cannot show any bias with any of these activities because they have donor contributions that are tax deductible. Because 501c4s are allowed to be much more political by nature, they do not generally have tax deductible donor contributions. And they also are able to lobby um, as long as it's related to their mission. They can also contribute to political campaigns, but not as a business expense, and they can endorse political candidates, but not as a primary function of the organization. Another key difference I would like to point out are that they have different timelines for when you can become either. So for 501c3s, you have to apply for tax exempt status 27 months after formation. With c4s, you must apply for tax exempt status within 60 days of formation. Also, the fees are a little different. 501c3s have anywhere from a $275 to $600 filing fee for the form 1023 or 1023EZ. It's dependent on how many annual contrib contributions they have um, between or above $50,000. For 501c4s, that financial burden is going to look like $50 fee to file a form 8976 and $600 to file a form 1024A. One more thing I'd like to point out is overall in this conversation, some of the details of tax exempt statuses and tax filings are going to vary state by state. So we're talking at a very large overall bird's eye view in this, in this topic today. 
501c19s, I will also cover this briefly because one of our panelists is going to speak on this in more detail during our panel discussion, but these are organizations that benefit veterans of the United States Armed Forces. It can look different, um, these percentages I'm about to talk about, based on the model of the organization. It can be an auxiliary post or other models, but overall, at least 75% of the members must be past or present members of the United States Armed Forces, cadets, spouses, widows, or descendants. And they're operating exclusively for one of them, one of one or more of the following purposes: to promote general welfare, social welfare of the community, assist disabled and needy war veterans and members, provide entertainment, care, and assistance to hospitalized veterans or members, carrying on programs to perpetuate the memory of deceased veterans, kind of comfort their survivors. We also um it also includes conducting programs for religious, charitable, scientific, literary, or educational purposes, and then also sponsoring or participating in activities of a patriotic nature, providing insurance benefits for members or dependents, and then also providing social and recreational activities for members. Tax filing, a very exciting topic, but very necessary in this conversation. We'll start with the small guys first. We've got 990Ns, that's also referred to as a postcard, and it's an option for organizations with gross receipts of less than $50,000. Then we have 990EZs. This is a summarized version of a 990 and the second most commonly accepted. Then we have 990s, which are full length and a universal standard. 990PFs are for private foundations and they require less reporting because their donor origins are often private and not public, therefore they do not have to disclose as much public information. And then the considerations for both are that funders may have restrictions and funding to anything outside of a 501c3, especially because it pertains to um, political activities and lobbying. And then funders due diligence standards may require a 990EC or a 990, which are those two most common um, standards. And fiscal agents. A lot of our network uses fiscal agents, and it is something that people are exploring all the time. The ideal traits of a good perspective one are a, cl a clean financial record, having a good working relationship and line of communication, their ability and willingness to manage both external and internal financial responsibilities, and then sustainability. In our network, I would say we hear about sustainability the most from our partners. Um, it can be kind of difficult having a revolving door of fiscal agents that you as an organization are dealing with and also reintroducing to your stakeholders time and time again. So with the, with the sustainability point, a good question to ask in this search is how long a prospective fiscal agent can commit for and working that into your agreement beforehand. And that is it for our slides. Like I said, we're gonna keep it nice and concise and let our panel tell their stories and, and all of their different paths. So I will go ahead and spotlight our panelists now. And I'm also going to introduce them if you just give me one little moment. And we have with us, I'm going to start with Mercedes Kirkland Doyle of the Good News Community Kitchen. She is the founding CEO and was also a sergeant in the Army. Next, we have Donna Bolger. Bolger. She's the co-founding vice president of Clear Path for Veterans New England. Next, we have Eddie Ramirez, a man of many titles. He is a retired master sergeant in the Air Force, the post commander of American Legion Cesar A. Chavez, post 505 also the founding former CEO of One Vet, One Voice, a 501c3. He's also the chair of the Bay Area CBEB. And lastly, but not least, we have Bill Snyder. He is the chief financial and operating officer of Move United. Thank you all for being here. You guys can unmute. We're going to go ahead and get into our questions now. You can unmute if, if you feel comfortable with the background noise. Um, so our first question is, what shaped your choice and timing in becoming a 501c3 or 501c19? I'm gonna first call on Mercedes to talk to us about that 501c3 journey. Thank you, Macy. Um, thank, thank you, Bob Woodrow Foundation for having me serve as a panelist today. Um, I'd have to say that I, I wanted to uh, in, ensure that uh, the Good News Community Kitchen was inclusive to all who had a, a, 
a, a need or food insecurity. Um, I love my vet veterans and I love uh, having uh, programs that are veteran centric. But um, as a mother, I just wanted to be, uh, I wanted my organization to be in a place to be able to provide services for all, not just limited to um, individuals who have served our country. Um, and I wanted to um, ensure that the, the donors who chose to support our organization um, would be able to, to write off their contributions to our organization, uh, whether it was in kind or a monetary donation. Thank you so much for sharing Mercedes. And then I'm gonna move on to Donna to talk about the origins of her decision. Thank you, Macy. And again, thank you for having us here today. I think this is a great topic of discussion. Um, I had uh, retired in 2015 from a 38 year career working for the Department of Army as a civilian. Um, I worked in a research and development um, center where we worked on everything that soldiers um, wore, carried and consumed. So I knew the military and I knew the veterans pretty well. And I knew that um, even if they didn't deploy, they were combat ready, they were trained. There were a lot of physical injuries, a lot of emotional um, they had a lot of emotional impact from their service. And so I knew when I retired, it was natural for me to want to move on and do something for the veterans in the community. My husband met some veterans from Clear Path for Veterans in Chittenango, New York, and they invited us out for a visit. And we walked through the front door and felt like we should have one of these centers in every community across the country. And so my husband and I returned home and started on a path to a Establish our 501c3 status. And with the help of New York, we use their name and we use their business model. And we we're able to quickly start up a 501c3. So it's been an awesome journey since then. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that model structure. And then to represent our 501c19 journey, I'm going to call on Eddie next for the question. Well, first of all, thank you for having the opportunity, getting the opportunity to be on the panel and the Bob Woodrow Foundation. You guys do some great work. Um, so cheers and salute for that. <laughs> um, I come from a kind of a unique uh, perspective because here in San Francisco, we had a veterans building and uh, the veterans, the American Legion helped raise funds to build this building. And as long as there's an American Legion post in San Francisco, we have the rights to that building in perpetuity forever. And once I found out what that building was about. I wanted to have that building as a focal point for our veterans. We had uh, about 11 American Legion posts there. And uh, one of the reasons why I went ahead and started a post was to be at the table. So um, I founded the Cesar E. Chavez post as 501C19 that put me at the table. So I have space in the office. I could use the building for events and for other um, training sessions or whatever we need to use the building for. And uh, it allows me to, to um, use that space for the veteran community. So that's one of the reasons why I established the 501C19, part of the American Legion, which is the parent company of the American Legion na nationwide. But I went ahead and pulled away from that and founded my own 501c19, which you could do where you separate from the parent and you become a tax exempt organization within the American Legion structure. So stay on with me, Eddie, actually, because we're going to go into the next question on that note. That's perfect. What benefits have you experienced since becoming a 501c19? And can you please specifically speak to the perks of separating from your parent company? Well, the benefits are number one, the building, of course. Uh, it, it allows me to have an office where I don't pay rent in the building. And the building is right across the street from City Hall, right across the street from the Opera House. So it's in Civic Center of San Francisco, which is a prime location. Uh, we have five meeting rooms. So it allows me to use these rooms to have different type of events. You know, I've had uh, what's called the, the San Francisco Veterans Film Festival. I created that and had that there. I had the San Francisco Veterans Town Halls there. I brought the uh, Air Force Band of the Golden West to the Herbst Theater, which is a 900 seat theater inside the building. So there's a lot of perks because I am a 501C19 American Legion. And 
it gives me that space to utilize and benefits for the veterans. So that's one of the reasons that, you know, I went ahead and took that route. And, um, you know, of course the 501c3 is different than the 501c19. A lot of organizations don't want to, or they think that a 501c19 is not tax exempt. So they shy away from donating to 501c19s. So I formed One Vet, One Voice, which was a 501c3 public good, which allows me to get donations from any organization that wants to donate to a 501c3. And I could use the 501c3 as a fiscal sponsor to the 501c19. So it works both ways. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing. I feel like that covers a lot of different experiences for the audience um, with the 501c3 and 19 and using the fiscal agent as well. I'm also going to direct this question of the benefits to Bill, who joins us from Move United, which is a large model structure. Thank you, Macy. It's a, it's a privilege to be here on this uh, panel today. Um, so the 501c3, uh, we've been a 501c3 for over 50 years. Um, and we have what's uh, basically a national network of other 501c3s across the country in 46 states. We have over 220 501c3s or um, parks and rec departments, things like that, uh, 50, um, 501c19s as well, uh, that are all part of our organization. Um, we're dedicated to helping people with individuals with disabilities through sports and recreation. So the benefits that we have are, and all 501c3s and 501c19s all uh, experience are um, exemption from a lot of taxes. So as an organization, you don't have to pay federal taxes. You don't have to pay local taxes. You don't have to pay property taxes. You don't have to pay payroll. Uh, you have to pay most payroll taxes, but uh, you don't have to pay federal unemployment taxes. Um, sales taxes, that depends on the state. Um, you have to usually apply within that state to become, if you're a 501c3 or 501c19, uh, you can apply to become uh, sales tax exempt, which is a big savings for uh, these organizations. Um, and Eddie was talking about the donations and having that be a tax uh, uh, deduction for the individual who's donating, do, uh, donating to uh, the organization. That's a huge benefit. I mean, that's that's the lifeblood of, of 501c3s. Um, but being a 501c3 or a 19, you're open to donations from organizations, bigger foundations like the Bob Woodard Foundation, like other organizations around, around the country that are supporting uh, your work in your area, so. Thank you so much for that. We're gonna move on to the antithesis of this. We're gonna look at the barriers that you've experienced, if any. And first, I'd like to start with Mercedes for this one. Oh, yes. So I am from South Carolina. Um, I am here in Northern Virginia though. And so the Good News Community Kitchen, it was founded in Northern Virginia. So I'm considered an outsider. Um, in addition to that, uh, to, in full transparency, many times I'm the only black person or the only female that's at the table. So I have to make sure, you know, like uh, everything is represented uh, across all, all platforms that um, my organization supports. Um, and that can be uncomfortable for me, and it could also be uncomfortable for the majority that's at the table. Uh, so being seen as an outsider, um, having to work twice as hard to gain trust, as well as, you know, uh, opportunities for uh, local resources has been a huge barrier. Um, not only that, in our area, most of the nonprofits that are 501c3s were formed and backed by churches. And with us, we're independent from any church or any um, political party. Um, so it's kind of hard. You know, it was definitely hard establishing our, ourselves uh, without that support uh, of the church. Uh, and, and that support really does go a very long way in the community, especially when you know you, you're not familiar with uh, various funding opportunities. So I'd, I'd have to say that the biggest barrier was being considered an outsider and then not really, you know, having representation at the table uh, to where I felt like, okay, well, would my um, outlook or percep perception and, and um, input be valued and utilized? So those were my barriers. Thank you for sharing your testimony with that. And for the same question, I'm gonna move on to Donna as well. What barriers have you experienced, if any? Yeah, thank you. And Mercedes, I will echo, echo that. Uh, you know, congratulations to you because it is hard work. Uh, similarly, 
Um, I'm not a veteran and I'm running a veteran service organization and that did create some of those same types of barriers and um, I didn't expect it so that going into the nonprofit world I didn't expect that I thought I'm bringing my passion and I'm bringing a plan um, but that did happen and um, so you learn from that and you know as we have our performance record in the community I, it's no, not as much of a barrier anymore but it's always a question I'm asked is so are you a veteran so I'm prepared now to respond to that um, I was also very surprised at how competitive the nonprofit community is. I felt like we're all here serving the same types of communities and needs, and there's more needs than all of us could service. And, uh, you know, that's what I love about the Woodruff Foundation. It's very collaborative. And um, so I see a lot of that. It's uh, still very competitive, but I think that's because people are competing for funding. And then I think the, the early on challenge that we had um, was most grant uh, grantors look for a record of performance before you can get a grant. So when you're a brand new nonprofit and you don't have a record of performance, um, you know, you have to really um, think about that as you set up your nonprofit is how are you going to create that record of performance so that you can get into the grant cycles. So thank you. Thank you, Donna. Before we move into some of our logistical questions, I want to mention that we didn't cover that much in the slides because everyone who's registered today will get a follow-up email from me with some direct links to IRS um, resources and whatnot. So you can hit the ground running if you want to proceed down any of the routes we're speaking of today. Um, very, very long and dry instructions. So we've saved it for an email rather than today's discussion. Um, but, but please feel confident that we will give you all the resources you need from today's topic. Now moving into the question of once you decided to pursue your designation, how did you start the process and what did it entail? I'm going to look first to Eddie to talk about the 501c19 journey. The 501c19 journey uh, for me was um, trying to figure out, okay, how do I establish a post within the American Legion? I found out the requirements. Uh, it, it turns out I needed 15 members uh, that were paid members to get a temporary charter for the American Legion. I, I looked at my, uh, my resources. I looked at my friends. Uh, who were veterans. I pulled my brother, I pulled my, my son, I pulled all the resources in my personal network and I got my 15 members. And once I did that, I went ahead and submitted the, the paperwork to get my temporary charter. And then within 90 days, uh, following some of the requirements from the American Legion, uh, having meetings and so on and so forth, I went ahead and got my permanent charter. So I had those, uh, prominently displayed up on the wall, temporary and permanent charters. And I'm officially a 501c19 Cesar E. Chavez. I went to the, uh, the Cesar Chavez Foundation to ask them if I could use the name and they allowed me to use the name and the, uh, the post number came out of the Cinco de Mayo. So 505 and um, created the Cesar Chavez post 505. And here I am. Amazing. And can I actually have you elaborate a little bit as well, Eddie? I know you mentioned to me in the past that you used a local university resource in creating your 501c19 too. If you could speak to that, please. Well, actually, I used their university for the 501c3. Okay. Uh, a lot of universities out there at law schools, they need to, to get their practicum done. So I approached one of the professors and I said, hey, I'm trying to start a 501c3. Can you guys help me with my articles of incorporation? So in order to establish the, and, and, and get the articles of incorporation to fly through the state, because I had to get them through the state first, state of California, uh, they went ahead and worked on the articles of incorporation to get all the wording just right. And once that was done, I was able to hand carry it to the uh, Secretary of State and they rubber stamped it. Within 30 days, I had my 501c19, or excuse me, 501c3 with the state of California. And then within 30 days or 60 days, I went ahead and applied for tax exemption to the IRS and was granted my, my determination letter, which is here. And with the determination letter, I became a nonprofit. And that's how it, it, it worked out very well for me. 
for the 501c3 and the 501c19. Thank you for sharing. I know that that resource, that creative, you know, resource in your community will probably inspire a lot of the audience. So I wanted to make sure we, we touched on that and directing the same question as well to Bill um, or Mercedes. I'm sorry. Once you decided to pursue the 501c3 designation, what did that process entail for you? Um, I just dedicated a lot of time to getting on the internet and researching, um, you know, typically you can re rely on social media, uh, but I didn't want to have any uh, outside influence. So I didn't look left or right. I just did my research with irs.gov, um, Secretary of State's websites, and um, just took my notes. Um, the one thing I did notice is that uh, every position that I had as a civil servant, a civil servant in the, um, the federal government, um, those duties actually came in handy uh, because I was able to write my, um, you know, articles of incorporation, my bylaws. I was able to form strategic partnership agreements and memorandums of understanding. And so all of those years I complained about doing that work, <laughs> I needed it. Um, so I took all of my, you know, experience uh, in, the, in the federal government and in the military and just apply that to all of the um, the amazing research that I found free uh, at my fingertips on the internet. Um, and then I just put it together um, and leaped. I know from all of our partners that it's no easy feat to, to go ahead and, and pursue this, any designation. So thank you for, for telling your story and um, hats off to you for, for getting it done. We definitely recognize that it is, and I can recognize through my research that it is no easy feat. Um, our next question is, what considerations became relevant in the process of pursuing a designation and what challenges did you come across, if any? We're going to go to Bill again, because you have that amazing, unique model that you can speak to. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so we had, um, when we constantly have applications coming in for organizations that want to join us, and some of them come in and um, they are bare bones, they're brand new. Uh, they're just starting up, you know, two people have a plan and they want to see through this mission and this vision of, of what they want to have happen. And they come to us kind of, what can we do? And so we're doing a lot of the same support work that um, Mercedes had when, uh, you know, the things that she, she wanted to do as a civil servant, a lot of the people are not uh, equipped to have, uh, you know, the resources to write their own articles of incorporation or to craft their bylaws. Uh, to know what kind of filings that they have to file in order to become um, become a, a 501c3, uh, to register with the state as a corporation, to get your EIN number. There's a lot of steps that that you have to play. The the resources, um, like Mercedes said, at irs.gov are fantastic. They lay it out step by step what you need to do in terms of becoming a, a 501c3. So um, we've develop tools ourselves as as a, a national leader in the in the space with adaptive sports so that uh, when an organization comes to us and, and has some deficiencies in some of those areas, we have templates and we have um, resources that we can share with them to get them to the level um, that they need to be to become a 501c3 and to become part of our network and to start to serve uh, the veterans and other individuals with disabilities that we serve across the country. So um, I think all the challenges that, that our organizations um, have, I think they're universal. It's not specific to our niche in terms of the 501c3 community. I think it's, it's something that, you know, Donna and Eddie and Mercedes and all, we've all experienced the same uh, challenges, um, but being able to turn to someone uh, like Eddie was able to turn to the university to, to get help with the, the writing, those being able to return turn to those resources and capitalize on those um, because you're doing, uh, you're, you're fulfilling a mission. You are working towards a greater good for um, the public, uh, whether it's specifically veterans or whether it's some other um, focus. That that is uh, the main thing that um, clears a lot of those obstacles for you because a lot of people can get behind you and support the good work that you're doing. Amazing, thank you. And for the sake of time, I'm actually going to stick on Bill for a moment. We have some financial questions, and we've got about ten minutes left, but I want to make sure we get into these because they are very relevant to this process. 
Um, the next question I have for you, Bill, is when it comes, or if your organization does financial audits, yes, um, tell us about the timing and purpose of deciding to. Sure. So um, the federal government only has uh, audit standards uh, when it comes to federal grants. So if you get $750,000 or more from the federal government, then you are required to have a what's called a single audit through um, an independent audit company, but that has to be submitted through their process. Um, each state has a different requirement. Some states require audits um, and some states don't. Uh, usually there's some type of financial threshold that you have to reach. Uh, and, and literally it's different in every single state. Um, in Maryland here, uh, where we're based and for our headquarters, it's $750,000. Out in California, where Eddie is, it's $2 million. So the, the, it changes based on that. Um, the timing of the audit is going to be usually a month to 45 days after the end of your fiscal year. And you're going to engage your auditors and you're going to uh, come up with a plan in terms of how they're going to proceed through the process. And it's usually, you know, a three month period and just in time for your um, your uh, filing deadline for your 990. Yeah. Thank you. And then one more financial question on that note, when it comes to maintaining that tax exempt status, once you obtain it, what should be considered regarding financial growth, staffing, and service implications? Yeah, you, the, the biggest thing is maintaining your uh, exempt purpose, okay? So you've, you've filed with the IRS to be, to serve in whatever way, you know, um, uh, Mercedes is doing um, the community kitchen. Your purpose, your your financials have to be directed towards that, uh, just from the strength of the mission. But in terms of the IRS's um, review, especially if you're going through an audit, to make sure that you are actually devoting your funds to that. Um, the 990, the 990EZ has a breakdown between programmatic expenses administrative expenses and fundraising expenses. And if you see the administrative and fundraising expenses, that percentage of the total get too high, it's it's looked on uh, quite negatively, especially by funding sources, not just the IRS. So keeping your dollars going towards your mission is, is key in all of that. Thank you. And on a similar note, as you navigate that program spend in the beginning stages and as you evolve, how, how did you navigate that? I'm going to direct that question to Mercedes. Um, as Bill mentioned, um, you have to keep your mission at the forefront of all that you do. Can you hear me? Oh. Am I frozen? Oh, you can hear me? Okay. Uh, yes, you have to keep your mission and uh, your core programs at the forefront of what you do. Um, and, and that, uh, especially in the beginning, before we uh, establish ourselves uh, as an organization that founders and, and um, foundations um, would support. My daughter, sorry. Um, you, you really have to make those tough decisions to like, where am I going to allocate the funding? Um, and so with keeping your core four programs, or for us, our core four programs, as well as our, our mission at the forefront, my daughter again, <laughs> um, that was uh, how we were able to, uh, you know, stay within our program budgeting. I apologize. <laughs> I apologize. My daughter keeps calling. Um, but no, uh, I have to keep aligning to what Bill said. You have to know why you're here, why you're in business, and you stay uh, steadfast on that. Um, in addition to, um, you know, uh, staying focused on my uh, the the program. Um, at the end of the day, um, the hunger relief um, had to align with the need of the community. So, in addition to knowing what our mission was, I needed to know what was the need within the community. So we studied the um, the county's uh, strategic plan as well as what the county's requirement. Um, and um, focus was on. So I wanted to make sure what our deliverables and our outputs were, they aligned with what the community needed. And that was uh, a way that we were able to kind of show a need and get the community or the county support to help us ensure that if nothing else, what we'd had funding uh, for the hunger relief initiative. And I apologize for the, for the calls, sorry. 
that's a great point of of using the community strategy to align your your origin programmatic strategy. That's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, same question: How do you navigate program spend in the beginning stages and as you evolve for Donna? Sure. Um, so I I would say that don't ever underestimate the power of your volunteer force. Um, nonprofits provide a great opportunity for volunteers to come in and lend their skills. And um, when you're building a program, they are worth gold. And so they, they can really help um, offset uh, spending and get you a really efficient and effective program. And also, I would suggest that you engage your uh, board of directors to really critically analyze the budgets that you put forward to them. Have them, encourage them to ask you difficult questions because you want to be able to be very transparent and answer that no, not only to your board of directors, but to anybody who walks through your front door. Thank you so much. And I see that we do that. This is the um, conclusion of our panel discussion, but now we're going to move into the Q&A um, with the audience. I see Tara left a very nice comment about um, the value of this content and especially Eddie's point about the law school resource. Um, I'm going to make this into a question of, are there any other resources that you guys can think of, whether it's specific to your community or otherwise, that helps you in this journey that may be useful for the audience? And anybody can chime in. Sure, I'll jump in and just let you know that I found the United Way, the local chapter of the United Way has a ton of resources that they've helped us with. So local community foundations and notably the United Way helped us a lot. If, um, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Mercedes. Mercedes, go ahead. Um, I was going to um, suggest uh, um, leveraging your local community college or your local university, maybe some marketing majors, writing majors. Um, um, and even um, if they have like a nonprofit uh, program, you definitely want to um, utilize the future leaders uh, in, um, in those uh, programs to add value to your program. Also, um, the college students, uh, it's something about their loyalty that's unlike any other. So I would definitely uh, urge you to uh, make the local community college or university one of your uh, community partners. And one thing I was going to say is that a lot of the documents that we use as nonprofits are public knowledge. And if one document has passed the the uh the checks and balances of the state i mean grab that document and tweak it tweak it to make it work for you and submit it because all the language is there and it's just a matter of forming it to what you want to do and resubmit it if the if, if, it, if it flew by one time with the state it should fly by again so as long as you're tweaking it and keeping the major words in there that you know public good and so on and so forth you could, you know, it's not plagiarism. You're just kind of tweaking and peeking and changing it. It's public knowledge. So, I mean, you know, public documents. Thank you so much, guys. And I also want to bring the attention to the comment from Jonathan in the comment section. I'll see you next week at NCHV, Jonathan. But he pointed out that um, they're so fortunate to have this program within their community foundation. Um, there's a nonprofit leadership training that was a few years ago. It's a year-long cohort training, um, and he's linked it in there. And somebody else is mentioning that resources, nonprofits, board members training, so people understand and adhere to statutory restrictions and best practices. Yes, so you also might want to make sure that board members and all of your staff and leadership are, are well versed in this as well, because it takes a village. So everybody keep looking at the comments with those direct links if you'd like to. And then I've got some questions from our network as well. Um, one of the first questions would be, what activities can jeopardize tax exempt status? Uh, political. Um, if you if you engage in um, uh, excessive lobbying, I mean, there's restrictions on how far you can go. Uh, advocacy is fine, public advocacy of your topic, but once you get into lobbying and um, any type of political. Um, sway towards one of the other, you know, a, a candidate, then you're dangerous, you're in dangerous territory there. Um, also, you need to stay on top of all your filings. So you have to, you have, 
you have to file your 990, whether it's the N, the EZ, or the full form um, in a timely manner. Otherwise, after a certain amount of time, the IRS will automatically uh, remove you from their roles and you'll have to be apply for reinstatement. Um, but you also have all your state filings as well. You have to stay on top of those to, to maintain your status. Um, absolutely. Just to piggyback off of Bill, um, depending on your state, you, you'll need to submit an um, annual uh, report uh, to be able to receive contributions. So for the Commonwealth of Virginia, that's through the, um, it's, the acronym is VDAX, but it's like, I think the um, Department of Agriculture. Um, and so you're, you, you're taxed on or you're you have fees assessed based on the amount of contributions you bring in. And then I think you subtract the federal funding and then you, you have to take into account how much you spend on um, fundraising um, with professionals. But definitely noncompliance will have you uh, without your status uh, in, in a heartbeat. Thank you. Anybody else want to answer this one? And I think also um, being sure you're sticking with your mission. If you go outside of your mission and you're collecting funds that are outside of your mission, you would jeopardize your status. And so yeah. in fundraising, you know, you have to be really careful when you're doing fundraising and make sure the fundraising is clear about where the funding is going and you're advertising that when you're doing the fundraising. Yeah, we're all supposed to be good stewards of the public's trust. And um, another thing, that I've just thought of is you, the money can't go, like if a nonprofit has a good year, it can't go into <laughs> the board of directors pockets. Uh, it's, it's, you can't, it's called um, personal inurement. You cannot have the funds uh, for an organization profit and individual. It has to profit the organization and your constituents. And document, you. document, document. You wanna make sure that you have good records, good documents, where the money's coming from, where's it going to? And you know, um, you wanna make sure that you, you're, you're transparent when it comes to uh, any type of audits. You wanna have good records for sure. Thank you all for your input on that one. Very important question and very important considerations. I have another question from the audience. It starts with, I have a fiscal sponsor with my nonprofit. I am newly formed. I am unsure of how to apply under my fiscal sponsor, but that seems like it would work for most grants since most grants want wants proof of so much money a year or also in existence for two to five years. Do you have any suggestions for a newly growing nonprofit? So I think if I understand the question, sorry. Um, is that they're operating under a fiscal sponsorship. So there are some restrictions when you go for grants and your sponsor is the one that would be going for the grant. Um, so you'd need to work really closely in partnership with your sponsor and because you would be going on their credentials. And so I think that's an important consideration. Yeah, but in terms of trying to get out from under, well, not underneath, like it's not <laughs> like you're being oppressed, but, um, in terms of uh, uh, transitioning from a fiscal agent to not to being on your own, um, you're gonna, like Eddie said, you're gonna keep records of everything that you've raised, even if it is through the uh, fiscal agent, because when you're applying for your 501c3 status through the 1023 form, you need to um, show your uh, history of giving um, over that time frame, And so having that information will make it easier in terms of proving that you are um, having the proper level of public support to become an, a 501c3. Um, but it's it's uh, baby steps. Um, you don't think that you can jump out there and take it all on your own until you have the infrastructure, whether it's volunteer based, uh, you know, through your board, or if it is, you know, your growth in terms of staffing capacity to handle that side of things when, when you're ready to make the move to that uh, to become a 501c3 yourself. Thank you. Um, I have another question from the audience that I am making sure I have properly understood so I can convey to you guys. So in the meantime, let me ask a, a more simple question. Um, 
are you exempt from all taxes with your designation? I know we spoke on this a little bit more, but if we could speak in detail, um, if once you're a 501 C3 or C19, are you exempt from all taxes or what exactly is this protecting you from financially? Um, you're, you're exempt from, for the organization itself, you're exempt from federal income tax and state income tax, okay? Um, and usually in your state property tax. Um, but then uh, from an individual standpoint, if you're working for a nonprofit, then you're exempt from federal unemployment tax. You still have to pay FICA. You still have to do your state withholding tax. You still have to do state unemployment. Those taxes are all the same for your employees, if you have employees, and for the organization itself. So, you know, your employer contributions towards Social Security and Medicare, that's still all happening. So I hope that answered the person's question. Yes, very good. And, and I think also you, in our state, you can apply for exemption from sales tax and yeah. you have to apply in every case um, with the, with the um, stores, but you can get tax exemption from sales tax. Yeah, a lot of people think that just because you're a 501c3, you're exempt from sales tax everywhere. You're not. No. Good to know. I'm in Florida and we are exempt here. So that's good to know. Um, so I have another question from the audience and it is, is there a maximum amount that can be donated to a 501c3? I have a donor that wants to donate the fees for our players. I'm the, I'm the VP of a Texas high school hockey organization. No, there's no maximum. Good. I hope you like that, that answer because it's a good, <laughs> it's a good answer. <laughs> All right, let me have another question from our network and it is going to be, um, if there's any additional cost to consider outside of what I mentioned in the slides for filing with the forms or notary needs, any other legal considerations that people need to have ready to have in their back pocket before going forth? Of course. <laughs> um, so the the application to get permission to accept contributions, that has the cost. Um, if you're late, that has an additional cost, um, depending on, uh, you know, if you're doing things retroactively, um, it, it all depends on how much you receive the, pre, the, the prior year. Um, everything came with a, a, a fee, actually. Um, uh, I can't even pinpoint now. Uh, the, the Department of Agriculture, the IRS, um, of course, you, you have to pay to form your entity. Um, then you have to, you need an address, you need a post office box. Most grants don't accept a, a, a post office address. So you need a, a street address if possible. I think the UPS store has kind of found a way around that. Um, but there are going to be fees that come out of every, every single place you can imagine with, uh, with regard to forming your organization. Um, so save your receipts uh, and, and, and work on building those uh, community partners that want to see your nonprofit uh, thrive and exist, and, and they'll pay for it. I know um, uh, the, uh, what am I, I just had a, a moment, but um, there was an organization that wanted to see us succeed, and so they paid for our ribbon cutting ceremony. So, uh, you know, getting out into the community and building those partnerships and being likable and having you know people connect with your mission will also kind of you know help you uh, offset those prices or those fees. I think another cost consideration for a, a nonprofit that's starting is um, insurance. Um, sometimes nonprofits don't realize that they really need to consult um, an insurance specialist to make sure they're properly insured. One of the things that I was able to do is. Uh, uh, I had worked for the VA and um, I established a work study program where veterans that were going to school utilizing their GI Bill, they could actually come to work for the nonprofit and uh, the VA pays them under the work study program. And any organization could actually start a work study program, as long as they have the veterans doing work for the VA. In other words, getting enrollment up in the VA, getting information out on, on, on the benefits of the VA. And you could do a position description and actually submit that. And the VA will approve it most times. 
And then that way you could have veterans that are going to school utilizing their, their GI Bill come work for your nonprofit and get work experience. And the VA pays them. It's under the work study program. So I was able to do that and it worked out very well. Thank you so much, guys. We have two other questions that are a little bit more detailed. So I'm going to do a follow up via email of those. Um, we'll have our panelists answer them behind the scenes and I will make sure to give you guys an answer and I'll send it out to the entire audience um, just for the sake of time. I want to thank all of our amazing panelists um, in creating this content. The conversations I had with all four of them was really the, the bread and butter of, of building it out. So your guys' experience and expertise has been invaluable um, to what is oftentimes a dry topic. So thank you so much for the engaging conversation today. Um, just again, a reminder to the audience, I will be sending a follow-up email um, by end of day today with the resources that we've discussed from the audience, the resources we want to give you to go forth and prosper if you so choose. And I also include some answers from our panelists regarding the two questions that we were not able to get to. Great questions. Um, and then we will also be sending a recording from this webinar will be available. I'll include slides and all that good stuff. So um, I hope nobody spent time to taking too much notes today. We will give it all to you. Um, any other comments from our panelists before we, we say hello or goodbye? Thank you so much for this opportunity. It was great. It was great to get together and, and meet even more people and get more information myself. So I appreciate it. I want to echo Donna's uh, comments. Uh, it was outstanding and uh, we need to do more of this, get more 501c3s out there to help our veterans. Ditto. Absolutely. And good luck to any of the aspiring executive directors and CEOs of the future nonprofits that will add value to your community. So thank you, Bob Woodrow Foundation. Thank you again, everybody in our audience and our panel. I hope everybody has a great rest of your day and see you next time.